2002, The Two Towers. Now this one had a special challenge, being the middle chapter. It had neither a beginning nor an end. It was the middle. And as such, it needed to have its own little arcs, like fellowship, its own plot within the greater plot that felt complete, yet part of a bigger whole. Did it succeed? Mostly? Bear in mind that this trilogy is still the best studio trilogy we've seen in our lifetimes. And yes, I will fight you on that. But there is bound to be a weakest chapter, and I think this is it. Yet at the same time, it's kind of my favorite of the three. I consider Fellowship to be the most consistent. Return of the King has some of the highest highs. <laughs> but also some of the lowest lows. So while the two towers did some things amazingly right, there were still some things they couldn't quite figure out how to cram in properly with that three hour runtime looming. So today we will take a look at the two towers. Because you can like a thing while still examining its cultural impact and exploring its flaws. This can be done. Let me show you. Let us first start with some issues in the adaptation of characters. For a first example, let's look at the introduction, if you can call it that, of a bunch of new characters of the Rohirrim. Now, in the book, the people of Rohan effectively get no introduction. We, the reader, meet them when the characters do. We meet them when Gandalf shows up at Meduseld, and Prince Theodrid is already dead, and there's apparently this worm tongue clown. So in the movie, we back it up a bit and give them the slightest of introductions with dying guy we don't know, and royal vizier who might be just a touch evil. I can't tell, it's very subtle, and some guy we don't know gets exiled or something. In the extended cut, we get even more of an introduction, like, you know, 30 seconds more. At least then we know who Dying Guy is, and who Aomer is in relation to the king, and who this lady is, and oh Jesus, God, there are a lot of characters here. And that's the thing when you're trying to adapt a book that has so many characters in it, and most of the audience won't have read the book. You don't have a lot of time for each character to get across to the audience who they are, what their personality is, why we should care about them. So most, if not all, of the characters get distilled into a very few key character traits. So you remember the two hobbits that no one can tell apart? Mary, it's Frodo Baggins. Hello, Frodo. Hello. Movie plays them up as hapless dumbasses who happen to be at the right place at the right time. In the book, they know all about Frodo's plan. Hell, Mary even knew about the ring. In the movie, they just tag along because... Why not? And some differentiation between the two is there. Mary is the clever, resourceful one, and Pippin the happy, dumb one. But in movie language, these traits are kind of subtle, especially with so much stimulus being thrown at you from other directions. So by the general casual movie-going public, the two get conflated anyway. The lowest common denominator or the casual movie-going public, i.e. most people. So where in the book Pippin is young, impulsive, and naive, it translates in the movie to him just being kind of dumb. What about second breakfast? So if Pippin's key trait is that he's kind of dumb, Treebeard seems to be that he's boring. Now don't be hasty, Master Mediato. Hasty? I think I might be one of the only people in the world that really loved the hell out of the Int chapter in the book, and I get the impression the filmmakers weren't too wild about it either. Where in the book, the two hobbits spend a lot of their time being in awe of Treebeard and learning about the Ents and getting to know their new buddy Quickbeam, who is so hasty he once interrupted another Ent in the middle of a sentence. In the movie, they spend most of their scenes with Treebeard being bored and then frustrated that he's not moving fast enough. Hell, by the end of it, they have to trick Treebeard into doing what they want him to. The closer we are to danger, the farther we are from harm. It's the last thing he'll expect. But what's frustrating for the audience avatars, in this case the two hobbits, is bound to translate into frustration for the audience. So it's not too surprising that audiences weren't crazy about the end scenes. Except for the payoff at the end. That was pretty awesome. Trees! Trees! Trees killing things! You 
could argue really that it's Pippin, not Frodo, who has the biggest arc of the four hobbits. Hell, the entire fellowship, really. His journey as a character makes him grow and change the most, where Frodo, well, I mean, you could argue that one. He gets more and more worn down, and Sam just gets devoted er. Take it, two face snake! Sam! Stop it! Stop it! We'll get to Sam next week. But I would argue that for a movie that has so many characters and this much stimulus being thrown at you and information that you're expected to remember, it does get across its intentions admirably for what it does and the time that it has. But not everybody can have an arc. We haven't looked at Gimli yet, so let's look at him. We dwarves are natural sprinters! Very dangerous over short distances! In movie one, he's more dynamic. He has comic relief moments, yes, but he also plots. If anyone was asked for my opinion, which I know they're not, I'd say we were taking the long way round. He grieves. No. And then he seeks revenge. Yeah. Let them come. He only has a couple of comic moments. Nobody tosses a dwarf. People must have really liked that line because in movie two, it's dwarf jokes all around. Breathe. Breathe. Oh, the time I get this adjusted. It's a little tight across the chest. He doesn't do much but tag along on the adventure, so he's pretty much relegated to comic relief while Legolas gets to be the cool badass. So Legolas got to be the badass in movie one, and everybody loved it. And I like the framing of it more in movie one. It was cool because it wasn't so overt. He's just, wow, this guy's an amazing shot. In movie two, not enough to be an amazing shot. Oh no, we gotta do it while shield surfing down some stairs. Which is to say nothing about movie three. Daddy three. Daddy four. Bigger. -er. <laughs> We didn't need an army, we just needed a couple of these guys. That's not to say, really, that there was much they could do with Legolas and Gimli. There just wasn't that much to work with from the book. Something draws near. I can feel it. Thanks for establishing some tension, Vagolas. In the book, Out of the Nine, Legolas is probably the least defined. So, in Fellowship, he kind of winds up being expository man. Grabine from Dunland. There is a fell voice on the air. He is Aragorn, son of Arathor. This is backstory, son of exposition. The only real moment of personality we get from Legolas is in the extended cut, where we find out that he, like Gimli, is a touch on the racist side. Yes, Gimli, their own masters cannot find them if their secrets are forgotten. Why doesn't that surprise me? So most of the character arc for these two, like in the book, is about how they learn to be buddies and get along and have an epic interracial bromance. They run as if the very whips of their masters were behind them. I think Orlando Bloom gets a bit of a bad rep. He's not a deplorable actor, he's just kinda, well, surrounded by... Come on. Outclassed, you might say. And he does have a couple of good acting moments. And there, right there, that look says, I am an elf and have never encountered mortality and I don't know how to deal with this. That's a good, subtle acting moment. You don't see much emotion from these two in movies two and three. Just the development of their friendship. But I like what little we do get in movie one. For me, the grief is still too near. It is there. Just not very often. Right, Gimli? <laughs> oh, oh, he fell down. The Two Towers features the two plot threads, and there is a cornerstone for both of them, a centerpiece if you will. The first being probably my least favorite giant chunk of the movies and the books for that matter, except for Tom Bombadil. And that, of course, is the Battle of Helm's Deep. Not because it's bad, but it just goes on and on, and it starts to feel like padding after a while. Also, what the hell is this? An alliance once existed between elves and men. We come to honor that allegiance. So the second to last alliance. Arwen was originally in these scenes, no really. So I have to assume that the elves were like, she snuck in with them and then they cut her part but kept the elves and also this guy goes down. Do you remember this guy's name? Casual moviegoer that saw Fellowship once or twice a year ago? Or that he was even in the first movie? Hey, guy with no emotional bond to any of the characters. 
Did you just show up for the sole purpose of dying a beautifully tragic death? So I feel like this little chunk was trying to capture a little bit of that magic that was Boromir's death in the first movie. But it works when Boromir dies because A, it's the end of the movie, and B, we just spent hours with him, getting to know him, learning his struggles. I know who you are, guy who was in the first movie and was kind of a dick for like 20 seconds. But what about Joanne and Cletus? I guess they'll think this is sad because the music tells them it's sad, but really, for the casual viewer, no one knows who you are, guy who is getting tragic death scene. Helm's Deep in the book is really not that long, or dramatic. Yes, there are 10,000 orcs that show up to fight, but they're quickly driven back by the awesome might of Helm's Deep, and then Gandalf shows up, and they get eaten by the trees. But the build-up to the battle in the movie goes on and on, and is longer than the battle itself. This is no rabble of mindless orcs. Okay, so you're saying it's hopeless. Not the Dagathire. Okay, so you're saying it's hopeless? They say that it is hopeless. Yes, we know it's hopeless. Although, if it wasn't for Helm's Deep, we also wouldn't have the best worst shot in all three films. Admittedly, it is pretty hard to pick and choose what will end up in the theatrical cut, bearing in mind that the theatrical cut is the version that most people will ever see. But all of this build-up for Helm's Deep comes at the expense of some really good stuff that you only see in the extended version. Like this scene with Boromir and Faramir from the extended cut that sets up Faramir's relationship with his father, and the love that the two brothers have for each other, and the preferential way that Denethor treats Boromir, and how Boromir's not cool with that. A oh, moment of peace can and moreover, we really need a scene to get to know and that humanizes Faramir. Because he is an asshole. The ring will go to Gondor. In the book, Faramir's a pretty nice guy. Maybe a little too nice because not a whole lot happens after he captures Frodo and Sam. As soon as he finds out Frodo has the ring, he pretty much immediately decides that he doesn't want to touch it. He's just that nice. He's not a dick to the hobbits and doesn't drag their asses to Asgiliath for yet another battle. And then, as if to compensate for the good scene they added in the extended version, they also added this. Oh, you're not looking at the cruelty you ordered your men to inflict? That must mean you have a sensitive soul. <laughs> Yes, I understand, in order for it to be a movie, it needs more conflict, but in this case, it comes at the expense of the likability of a character that the audience needs to sympathize with. To be fair, at least he does eventually revert to his book character by movie three, by spending most of it unconscious. But I said that there were two set pieces in this movie, the first being the big battle scene, the other one being... So bright. So... Beautiful. Ah, precious. I did not just squeak. Gollum is the best character in all three books, period. Yes, I may be a touch partial. Had an odd collection of Gollum posters back in college. Nella loved it, really. Might have stood in line all night once to meet Andy Serkis. Got a picture and everything. He smelled nice. What? Don't follow the lights. How easy would it have been to screw this up? We've seen Gollum done a couple times before in other adaptations, and if you're being charitable, you might say, at least he works within the tone of those films. <laughs> nice master. Nice master. But Gollum is out there, man. A hair in either direction, and we'd have another Jar Jar Binks on our hands. What's Tartus, brothers? What's Tartus, huh? He's like Gandalf's dialogue. In the wrong hands, this could have gone terribly. And the decision to make him totally CGI, to integrate him the way they did, he was a really huge gamble. They changed quite a bit from the book scenes-wise, added a bunch, but it really distills the tragedy of the character for a new audience. The schizophrenia thing is played up a lot. Master's my friend. You don't have any friends. 
And this scene right here turns on a dime several times. The audience is laughing, and then they go to sympathizing with him, and then they cheer for him. This scene uses its time very effectively. Also, this... <laughs> assholes. But while we're talking about Lord of the Rings and its influence, I would be remiss to neglect its main peer. <laughs> first Harry Potter movie came out about a month before Lord of the Rings and probably influenced the success of Fellowship very greatly. It really is kind of a coincidence that the two projects coincided the way that they did, that the viewing public was interested in high fantasy epics in a way that they never were before. Harry Potter may not have been directly responsible for the success of Lord of the Rings, but it certainly didn't hurt. Harry Potter is fantasy, but modern fantasy, therefore more accessible. It's also based on a book series that everyone was reading at the time, and therefore was bound to be a huge success even with Hollywood's brightest hack making a mediocre movie like Sorcerer's Stone ended up being. So in wetting an appetite for high fantasy, the Harry Potter books and movies certainly didn't hurt Fellowship's grosses, especially considering that Fellowship wasn't aiming at the exact same demographic. The Lord of the Rings movies were for an older audience. Most of the, well, we won't call them knockoffs, but projects that were influenced by the success of Lord of the Rings were clearly trying to suckle that demographic teat from both franchises. The Chronicles of Narnia, Stardust, the Spiderwick Chronicles, the Golden Compass especially, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. You look at Narnia especially, which was trying so hard to be the next Lord of the Rings. It was based off a book by one of Tolkien's contemporaries, and everybody already knew it. Got epic other worlds and fawns. They wanted so bad for it to be Lord of the Rings that they really tried a little incredibly way too hard. Dun dun da 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 dun! Is this epic enough for you? Fantasy wars and shit, yeah! Dun da da! Things can get a little awkward when you try to movie epicify a short little children's book into something it's not. Ahem. Also, those movies weren't very good. But these are the more obvious influences and in the resurgence of high fantasy as a viable moneymaker. There are other, perhaps less obvious influences, but we'll get into those next week. For now, hmm. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Oh, right. 